How will William Lantry live in a world where no one knows him? For he was born 350 years ago, and he just got out of his grave. Ray Bradbury, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. You get so much out of this. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It helps us have something solid to count on every month. You can build out your classic audiobook library and you help to give more folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. If it's more convenient, we're streaming our episodes through YouTube now. A link can be found in the description for today's episode. We are working our way through the archives. We should have some new products showing up this week at the website. Be sure to check it out. Today's story was originally released in the summer issue of Planet Stories in 1948. Ray Bradbury was one of the best-known writers of our time. He was a master storyteller, a champion of creative freedom, and a space-age visionary. He was a close friend with Ray Harryhausen, the stop-motion special effects pioneer, and the two bonded over their love of making monsters real. Bradbury's most noteworthy works include The Martian Chronicles, Fahrenheit 451, Dandelion Wine, and Something Wicked This Way Comes. And now, Pillar of Fire, Part 1 of 2, by Ray Bradbury. He came out of the earth, hating. Hate was his father. Hate was his mother. It was good to walk again. It was good to leap up out of the earth, off of your back, and stretch your cramped arms violently and try to take a deep breath. He tried. He cried out. He couldn't breathe. He flung his arms over his face and tried to breathe. It was impossible. He walked on the earth. He came out of the earth. But he was dead. He couldn't breathe. He could take air into his mouth and force it half down his throat, with withered moves of long, dormant muscles, wildly, wildly. And with this little air, he could shout and cry. He wanted to have tears, but he couldn't make them come either. All he knew was that he was standing upright. He was dead. He shouldn't be walking. He couldn't breathe, and yet he stood. The smells of the world were all about him. Frustratedly, he tried to smell the smells of autumn. Autumn was burning the land down into ruin. All across the country the ruins of summer lay. Vast forests, bloomed with flame, tumbled down timber on empty, unleafed timber. The smoke of the burning was rich, blue, and invisible. He stood in the graveyard, hating. He walked through the world, and yet could not taste nor smell of it. He heard, yes, the wind roared on his newly opened ears. But he was dead. Even though he walked, he knew he was dead, and should expect not too much of himself or this hateful living world. He touched the tombstone over his own empty grave. He knew his own name again. It was a good job of carving. William Lantry. 
as with the gravestone sat. His fingers trembled on the cool stone surface. Born 1898, died 1933. Born again? What year? He glared at the sky and the midnight autumnal stars moving in slow illuminations across the windy black. He read the tiltings of centuries in those stars. Orion, thus and so, Origa, here, and where Taurus, there. His eyes narrowed, his lips spelled out the year. 2349. An odd number, like a school sum. They used to say a man couldn't encompass any number over a hundred. After that, it was all so damned abstract, there was no use counting. This was the year 2349. A numeral, a sum. And here he was. A man who had lain in his hateful, dark coffin, hating to be buried, hating the living people above, who lived and lived and lived, hating them for all the centuries until today. Now, born out of hatred, he stood by his own freshly excavated grave, the smell of raw earth in the air, perhaps, but he could not smell it. Aye, he said, addressing a poplar tree that was shaken by the wind, am an anachronism. He smiled faintly. He looked at the graveyard. It was cold and empty. All of the stones had been ripped up and piled like so many flat bricks, one atop another, in the far corner by the wrought iron fence. This had been going on for two endless weeks. In his deep secret coffin he had heard the heartless, wild stirring as the men jabbed the earth with cold spades and tore out the coffins and carried away the withered ancient bodies to be burned. Twisting with fear in his coffin, he had waited for them to come to him. Today they had arrived at his coffin, but late. They had dug down to within an inch of the lid. Five o'clock bell, time for quitting. Home to supper. The workers had gone off. Tomorrow they would finish the job, they said, shrugging into their coats. Silence had come to the emptied tomb yard. Carefully, quietly, with a soft rattling of sod, the coffin lid had lifted. William Lantry stood, trembling now, in the last cemetery on earth. Remember, he asked himself, looking at the raw earth. Remember those stories of the last man on earth? Those stories of men wandering in ruins, alone? Well, you, William Lantry, are a switch on the old story. Do you know that? You are the last dead man in the whole damned world. There were no more dead people. Nowhere in any land was there a dead person. Impossible? Lantry did not smile at this. No, not impossible at all, in this foolish, sterile, unimaginative, antiseptic age of cleansings and scientific methods. People died. Oh, my God, yes, but dead people? Corpses? Huh. They didn't exist. What happened to dead people? The graveyard was on a hill. William Lantry walked through the dark, burning night until he reached the edge of the graveyard and looked down upon the new town of Salem. It was all illumination 
all color. Rocket ships cut fire above it, crossing the sky to all the far ports of Earth. In his grave, the new violence of this future world had driven down and seeped into William Lantry. He had been bathed in it for years. He knew all about it, with a hating dead man's knowledge of such things. Most important of all, he knew what these fools did with dead men. He lifted his eyes. In the center of the town, a massive stone finger pointed at the stars. It was three hundred feet high and fifty feet across. There was a wide entrance and a drive in front of it. In the town, theoretically, thought William Lantry, say you have a dying man. In a moment he will be dead. What happens? No sooner is his pulse cold, when a certificate is flourished, made out, his relatives pack him into a car beetle and drive him swiftly to the incinerator. That functional finger, that pillar of fire pointing at the stars, incinerator. A functional, terrible name. But truth is truth in this future world. Like a stick of kindling, your Mr. Dead Man is shot into the furnace. Flume. William Lantry looked at the top of the gigantic pistol, shoving at the stars. A small pennant of smoke issued from the top. There's where your dead people go. Take care of yourself, William Lantry, he murmured. You're the last one. The rare item, the last dead man. All the other graveyards of Earth have been blasted up. This is the last graveyard, and you're the last dead man from the centuries. These people don't believe in having dead people about, much less walking dead people. Everything that can't be used goes up like a matchstick, superstitions right along with it. He looked at the town. All right, he thought quietly. I hate you. You hate me. Or you would if you knew I existed. You don't believe in such things as vampires or ghosts. Labels without reference, you cry. You snort. All right, snort. Frankly, I don't believe in you either. I don't like you. You and your incinerators. He trembled. How very close it had been. Day after day, they had hauled out the other dead ones, burned them like so much kindling. An edict had been broadcast around the world. He had heard the digging men talk as they worked. I guess it's a good idea, this cleaning up the graveyards, said one of the men. I guess so, said another. Grizzly custom. Can you imagine? Being buried, I mean. Unhealthy. All them germs. Sort of a shame. Romantic, kind of. I mean, leaving just this one graveyard untouched all these centuries. The other graveyards were cleaned out. What year was it, Jim? About 2260, I think. Yeah, that was it, 2260. Almost a hundred years ago. But some Salem committee, they got on their high horse and they said, Look here, let's have just one graveyard left to remind us of the customs of the barbarians. And the government scratched its head, thunking over and said, Okay, Salem it is. But all other graveyards go, you understand. All. And away they went, said Jim. Sure they sucked him out with fire and steam shovels and rocket cleaners. If they knew a man was buried in a cow pasture, they fixed him. Evacuated him, they did. Sort of cruel, I say. I hate to sound old-fashioned, but still there were lots of tourists came here every year just to see what a real graveyard was like. Right. 
We had nearly a million people in the last three years visiting. A good revenue. But a government order is an order. The government says no more morbidity. So flush her out we do. Here we go. Hand me that spade, Bill. William Lantry stood in the autumn wind on the hill. It was good to walk again, to feel the wind and to hear the leaves scuttling like mice on the road ahead of him. It was good to see the bitter cold stars almost blown away by the wind. It was even good to know fear again, for fear rose in him now, and he could not put it away. The very fact that he was walking made him an enemy. And there was not another friend, another dead man in all of the world to whom one could turn for help or consolation. It was the whole melodramatic living world against one William Lantry. It was the whole vampire-disbelieving, body-burning, graveyard-annihilating world against a man in a dark suit on a dark autumn hill. He put out his pale, cold hands into the city illumination. You have pulled the tombstones like teeth from the yard, he thought. Now I will find some way to push your damnable incinerators down into rubble. I will make dead people again, and I will make friends in so doing. I cannot be alone and lonely. I must start manufacturing friends very soon. Tonight. War is declared, he said, and laughed. It was pretty silly, one man declaring war on an entire world. The world did not answer back. A rocket crossed the sky on a rush of flame, like an incinerator taking wing. Footsteps. Lantry hastened to the edge of the cemetery. The diggers coming back to finish up their work? No. Just someone, a man, walking by. As the man came abreast the cemetery gate, Lantry stepped swiftly out. Good evening, said the man, smiling. Lantry struck the man in the face. The man fell. Lantry bent quietly down and hit the man a killing blow across the neck with the side of his hand. Dragging the body back into shadow, he stripped it, changed clothes with it. It wouldn't do for a fellow to go wandering about this future world with ancient clothing on. He found a small pocket knife in the man's coat. Not much of a knife, but enough if you knew how to handle it properly. He knew how. He rolled the body down into one of the already opened and exhumed graves. In a minute, he had shoveled dirt down upon it, just enough to hide it. There was little chance of it being found. They wouldn't dig the same grave twice. He adjusted himself in his new loose-fitting metallic suit. Fine, fine. Hating, William Lantry walked down into town to do battle with the earth. Two. The incinerator was open. It never closed. There was a wide entrance, all lighted up with hidden illumination. There was a helicopter landing table and a beetle drive. The town itself was dying down after another day of the dynamo. The lights were going dim, and the only quiet, lighted spot in the town now was the incinerator. God, what a practical name. What an unromantic name. William Lantry entered the wide, well-lighted door. It was an entrance, really. There were no doors to open or shut. People could go in and out summer or winter. The inside was always warm. Warm from the fire that rushed whispering up the high, round flue 
to where the whirlers, the propellers, the air jets pushed the leafy gray ashes on away for a ten-mile ride down the sky. There was the warmth of the bakery here. The halls were floored with rubber parquet. You couldn't make a noise if you wanted to. Music played in hidden throats somewhere. Not music of death at all, but music of life, and the way the sun lived inside the incinerator, or the sun's brother, anyway. You could hear the flame floating inside the heavy brick wall. William Lantry descended a ramp. Behind him, he heard a whisper, and turned in time to see a beetle stop before the entranceway. A bell rang. The music, as if at a signal, rose to ecstatic heights. There was joy in it. From the beetle, which opened from the rear, some attendants stepped carrying a golden box. It was six feet long, and there were sun symbols on it. From another beetle, the relatives of the man in the box stepped and followed as the attendants took the golden box down a ramp to a kind of altar. On the side of the altar were the words, We that were born of the sun return to the sun. The golden box was deposited upon the altar. The music leaped upward. The guardian of this place spoke only a few words. Then the attendants picked up the golden box, walked to a transparent wall, a safety lock, also transparent, and opened it. The box was shoved into the glass slot. A moment later, an inner lock opened. The box was injected into the interior of the flue and vanished instantly in quick flame. The attendants walked away. The relatives, without a word, turned and walked out. The music played. William Lantry approached the glass fire lock. He peered through the wall at the vast, glowing, never-ceasing heart of the incinerator. It burned steadily, without a flicker, singing to itself peacefully. It was so solid it was like a golden river, flowing up out of the earth toward the sky. Anything you put into the river was borne upward, vanished. Lantry felt again his unreasoning hatred of this thing, this monster, cleansing fire. A man stood at his elbow. May I help you, sir? What? Lantry turned abruptly. What did you say? May I be of service? I... That is. Lantry looked quickly at the ramp and the door. His hands trembled at his sides. I've never been in here before. Never? The attendant was surprised. That had been the wrong thing to say, Lantry realized. But it was said nevertheless. I mean, he said, not really. I mean... When you're a child, somehow, you don't pay attention. I suddenly realized tonight that I didn't really know the incinerator. The attendant smiled. We never know anything, really, do we? I'll be glad to show you around. Oh, no, never mind. It, it's a wonderful place. Yes, it is. The attendant took pride in it. One of the finest in the world, I think. I... Landry felt he must explain further. I haven't had many relatives die on me since I was a child. In fact, none. So, you see, I haven't been here for many years. I see. The attendant's face seemed to darken somewhat. What have I said now? Thought Landry. What in God's name is wrong? What have I done? If I'm not careful, I'll get myself shoved right into that damnable fire trap. What's wrong with this fellow's face? He seems to be giving me more than the usual going over. You wouldn't be one of the men who've just returned from Mars, would you? Asked the attendant. No. 
Why do you ask? No matter. The attendant began to walk off. If you want to know anything, just ask me. Just one thing, said Lantry. What's that? This. Lantry dealt him a stunning blow across the neck. He had watched the fire trap operator with expert eyes. Now, with a sagging body in his arms, he touched the button that opened the warm outer lock, placed the body in, heard the music rise, and saw the inner lock open. The body shot out into the river of fire. The music softened. Well done, Lantry. Well done. Barely an instant later, another attendant entered the room. Lantry was caught with an expression of pleased excitement on his face. The attendant looked around as if expecting to find someone. Then he walked toward Lantry. May I help you? Just looking, said Lantry. Rather late at night, said the attendant. I couldn't sleep. That was the wrong answer, too. Everybody slept in this world. Nobody had insomnia. If you did, you simply turned on a hypno-ray, and sixty seconds later, you were snoring. Oh, he was just full of wrong answers. First he had made the fatal error of saying he had never been in the incinerator before, when he knew damned well that all children were brought here on tours, every year, from the time they were four, to instill the idea of the clean fire death and the incinerator in their minds. Death was a bright fire. Death was warmth and the sun. It was not a dark, shadowed thing. That was important in their education. And he, pale, thoughtless fool, had immediately gabbled out his ignorance. And another thing, this paleness of his. He looked at his hands and realized with growing terror that a pale man also was non-existent in this world. They would suspect his paleness. That was why the first attendant had asked, Are you one of those men newly returned from Mars? Here, now, this new attendant was clean and bright as a copper penny, his cheeks red with health and energy. Lantry hid his pale hands in his pockets, but he was fully aware of the searching the attendant did on his face. I mean to say, said Lantry, I didn't want to sleep. I wanted to think. Was there a service held here a moment ago? Asked the attendant, looking about. I don't know, I just came in. Thought I heard the fire lock open and shut. I don't know, said Lantry. The man pressed a wall button. Anderson? A voice replied. Yes? Locate Saul for me, will you? I'll ring the corridors. A pause. Can't find him. Thanks. The attendant was puzzled. He was beginning to make little sniffing motions with his nose. Do you smell anything? Lantry sniffed. No. Why? I smell something. Lantry took hold of the knife in his pocket. He waited. I remember once when I was a kid, said the man and we found a cow lying dead in the field. It had been there two days in the hot sun. That's what this smell is. I wonder what it's from. Oh, I know what it is, said Lantry quietly. He held out his hand. Here. What? Me, of course. You? Dead. Several hundred years. You're an odd joker. The attendant was puzzled. Very. Lantry took out the knife. Do you know what this is? A knife. Do you ever use knives on people anymore? How do you mean? I mean, killing them. With knives or guns or poison. You are an odd joker. The man giggled awkwardly. I'm going to kill you said Lantry. Nobody kills anybody, said the man. Not anymore they don't, but they used to, in the old days. I know they did. 
This will be the first murder in three hundred years. I just killed your friend. I just shoved him into the firelock. That remark had the desired effect. It numbed the man so completely. It shocked him so thoroughly with its illogical aspects that Lantry had time to walk forward. He put the knife against the man's chest. I'm going to kill you. That's silly, said the man numbly. People don't do that. Like this, said Lantry. You see? The knife slid into the chest. The man stared at it for a moment. Lantry caught the falling body. Three. The Salem flu exploded at six that morning. The great fire chimney shattered into ten thousand parts and flung itself into the earth and into the sky and into the houses of the sleeping people. There was fire and sound, more fire than autumn made, burning in the hills. William Lantry was five miles away at the time of the explosion. He saw the town ignited by the great spreading cremation of it and he shook his head and laughed a little bit and clapped his hands smartly together. Relatively simple. He walked around killing people who didn't believe in murder, had only heard of it indirectly as some dim, gone custom of the old barbarian races. He walked into the control room of the incinerator and said, How do you work this incinerator? And the control man told you because everybody told the truth in this world of the future. Nobody lied. There was no reason to lie. There was no danger to lie against. There was only one criminal in the world, and nobody knew he existed yet. Oh, it was an incredibly beautiful setup. The control man had told him just how the incinerator worked, what pressure gauges controlled the flood of fire gases going up the flue, what levers were adjusted or readjusted. He and Lantry had had quite a talk. It was an easy, free world. People trusted people. A moment later, Lantry had shoved a knife in the control man also and set the pressure gauges for an overload to occur half an hour later and walked out of the incinerator halls whistling. Now even the sky was palled with the vast black cloud of the explosion. This is only the first, said Lantry, looking at the sky. I'll tear all the others down, before they even suspect there's an unethical man loose in their society. They can't account for a variable like me. I'm beyond their understanding. I'm incomprehensible, impossible. Therefore, I do not exist. My God, I can kill hundreds of thousands of them before they even realize murder is out in the world again. I can make it look like an accident each time. Why? The idea is so huge it's unbelievable. The fire burned the town. He sat under a tree for a long time, until morning. Then he found a cave in the hills and went in to sleep. He awoke at sunset with a sudden dream of fire. He saw himself pushed into the flue, cut into sections by flame, burned away to nothing. He sat up on the cave floor, laughing at himself. He had an idea. He walked down into the town and stepped into an audio booth. He dialed operator. Give me the police department, he said. I beg your pardon? said the operator. He tried again. The law force, he said. I will connect you with the peace control, she said at last. A little fear began ticking inside him like a tiny watch. Suppose the operator recognized the term police department as an anachronism, took his audio number and sent someone out to investigate. No, she wouldn't do that. Why should she suspect? Paranoids were non-existent in this civilization. 
Yes, the peace control, he said. A buzz. A man's voice answered. Peace control, Stephen speaking. Give me the homicide detail, said Lantry, smiling. The what? Who investigates murders? I beg your pardon? What are you talking about? Wrong number. Lantry hung up, chuckling. Ye gods. There was no such thing as a homicide detail. There were no murders, therefore they needed no detectives. Perfect. Perfect. The audio rang back. Lantry hesitated, then answered. Say, said the voice on the phone, who are you? The man just left who called, said Lantry, and hung up again. He ran. They would recognize his voice and perhaps send someone out to check. People didn't lie. He had just lied. They knew his voice. He had lied. Anybody who lied needed a psychiatrist. They would come to pick him up to see why he was lying, for no other reason. They suspected him of nothing else. Therefore, he must run. Oh, how very carefully he must act from now on. He knew nothing of this world, this odd, straight, truthful, ethical world. Simply by looking pale, you were suspect. Simply by not sleeping nights, you were suspect. Simply by not bathing, by smelling like a dead cow, you were suspect. Anything. He must go to a library. But that was dangerous, too. What were libraries like today? Did they have books or did they have film spools which projected books on a screen? Or did people have libraries at home, thus eliminating the necessity of keeping large main libraries? He decided to chance it. His use of archaic terms might well make him suspect again, but now it was very important he learn all that could be learned of this foul world into which he had come again. He stopped a man on the street. Which way to the library? The man was not surprised. Two blocks east, one block north. Thank you. Simple as that. He walked into the library a few minutes later. May I help you? He looked at the librarian. May I help you? May I help you? What a world of helpful people. I'd like to have Edgar Allan Poe. His verb was carefully chosen. He didn't say read. He was too afraid that books were passé, that printing itself was a lost art. Maybe all books today were in the form of fully delineated three-dimensional motion pictures. How in hell could you make a motion picture out of Socrates, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Freud? What was that name again? Edgar Allan Poe. There is no such author listed in our files. Will you please check? She checked. Oh, yes, there's a red mark on the file card. He was one of the authors in The Great Burning of 2265. How ignorant of me. That's all right, she said. Have you heard much of him? He had some interesting barbarian ideas on death, said Lantry. Horrible ones, she said, wrinkling her nose. Ghastly, yes, ghastly. Abominable, in fact. Good thing he was burned, unclean. By the way, do you have any of Lovecraft? Is that a sex book? Lantry exploded with laughter. No, no, it's a man. She riffled the file. He was burned too, along with Poe. I suppose that applies to Macken, and a man named Durleth, and one named Ambrose Bierce also? Yes. She shut the file cabinet. All burned, and good riddance. She gave him an odd, warm look of interest. I bet you've just come back from Mars. Why do you say that? There was another explorer in here yesterday. he just made the Mars hop and return. He was interested in supernatural literature also. It seems there are actually tombs on Mars. What are tombs? Lantry was learning to keep his mouth closed. You know, those things they once buried people in. Barbarian custom. Ghastly. Isn't it? 
Well, seeing the Martian tombs made this young explorer curious. He came and asked if we had any of those authors you mentioned. Of course, we haven't even a smitch of their stuff. She looked at his pale face. You are one of the Martian rocket men, aren't you? Yes, he said. Got back on the ship the other day. The other young man's name was Burke. Of course, Burke. Good friend of mine. Sorry I can't help you. You'd best get yourself some vitamin shots and some sun lamp. You look terrible, Mr. Uh... Landry. I'll be good. Thanks ever so much. See you next Hallow's Eve. Aren't you the clever one? She laughed. If there were a Hallow's Eve, I'd make it a date. But they burned that, too, he said. Oh, they burned everything, she said. Good night. Good night. And he went on out. Oh, how carefully he was balanced in this world. Like some kind of dark gyroscope, whirling with never a murmur, a very silent man. As he walked along the eight o'clock evening street, he noticed with particular interest that there was not an unusual amount of lights about. There were the usual street lights at each corner, but the blocks themselves were only faintly illuminated. Could it be that these remarkable people were not afraid of the dark? Incredible nonsense! Everyone was afraid of the dark. Even he himself had been afraid as a child. It was as natural as eating. A little boy ran on pelting feet, followed by six others. They yelled and shouted and rolled on the dark, cool October lawn in the leaves. Lantry looked on for several minutes before addressing himself to one of the small boys, who was, for a moment, taking a respite, gathering his breath into his small lungs, as a boy might blow to refill a punctured paper bag. Here now, said Lantry, you'll wear yourself out. Sure, said the boy. Could you tell me, said the man, why there are no street lights in the middle of the blocks? Why? asked the boy. I'm a teacher. I thought I'd test your knowledge, said Lantry. Well, said the boy, you don't need lights in the middle of the block, that's why. But it gets rather dark, said Lantry. So? said the boy. Aren't you afraid? asked Lantry. Of what? asked the boy. The dark, said Lantry. Ho, oh, ho, said the boy. Why should I be? Well, said Lantry, it's black, it's dark. And after all, street lights were invented to take away the dark and take away fear. That's silly. Street lights were made so you could see where you were walking. Outside of that, there's nothing. You miss the whole point, said Lantry. Do you mean to say you would sit in the middle of an empty lot all night and not be afraid? Of what? Of what? Of what? Of what, you little ninny? Of the dark! Oh! Would you go out in the hills and stay all night in the dark? Sure. Would you stay in a deserted house, alone? Sure. And not be afraid? Sure. You're a liar. Don't you call me nasty names, shouted the boy. Liar was the improper noun indeed. It seemed to be the worst thing you could call a person. Blantry was completely furious with the little monster. Look, he insisted. Look into my eyes. The boy looked. Lantry bared his teeth slightly. He put out his hands, making a claw-like gesture. He leered and gesticulated, and wrinkled his face into a terrible mask of horror. Ho, oh, ho, said the boy. You're funny. What did you say? You're funny. Do it again. Hey, gang, come here. This man does funny things. Never mind. Do it again, sir. Never mind. Never mind. Good night. Lantry ran off. Good night, sir, and mind the dark, sir, called the little boy. Of all the stupidity, of all the rank, gross, crawling, jelly-mouthed stupidity, he had never seen the like of it in his life. 
bringing the children up without so much as an ounce of imagination. Where was the fun in being children if you didn't imagine things? He stopped running. He slowed, and for the first time began to appraise himself. He ran his hand over his face and bit his finger, and found that he himself was standing midway in the block, and he felt uncomfortable. He moved up to the street corner where there was a glowing lantern. That's better, he said, holding his hands out like a man to an open, warm fire. He listened. There was not a sound except the night breathing of the crickets. Faintly, there was a fire hush as a rocket swept the sky. It was the sound a torch might make, brandished gently on the dark air. He listened to himself, and for the first time he realized what there was so peculiar to himself. There was not a sound in him. The little nostril and lung noises were absent. His lungs did not take nor give oxygen or carbon dioxide. They did not move. The hairs in his nostrils did not quiver with warm, combing air. That faint, purring whisper of breathing did not sound in his nose. Strange. Funny. A noise you never heard when you were alive. The breath that fed your body, and yet once dead, Oh, how you missed it. The only other time you ever heard it was on deep, dreamless, awake nights, when you wakened and listened and heard first your nose taking and gently poking out the air, and then the dull, deep, dim red thunder of the blood in your temples, in your eardrums, in your throat, in your aching wrists, in your warm loins, in your chest. All of those little rhythms, gone. The wrist beat, gone. The throat pulse, gone. The chest vibration, gone. The sound of the blood coming up and down, around and through, up, down, around and through. Now it was like listening to a statue. And yet he lived, or rather, moved about. And how was this done? over and above scientific explanations, theories, doubts, by one thing, and one thing alone. Hatred. Hatred was a blood in him. It went up, down, around, and through. Up, down, around, and through. It was a heart in him, not beating true but warm. He was, what? Resentment. Envy. They said he could not lie any longer in his coffin in the cemetery. He had wanted to. He had never had any particular desire to get up and walk around. It had been enough, all these centuries, to lie in the deep box and feel but not feel the ticking of the million insect watches in the earth around, the moves of worms like so many deep thoughts in the soil. But then they had come and said, out you go and into the furnace, and that is the worst thing you can say to any man. You cannot tell him what to do. If you say you are dead, he will want not to be dead. If you say there are no such things as vampires, by God, that man will try to be one just for spite. If you say a dead man cannot walk, he will test his limbs. If you say murder is no longer occurring, he will make it occur. He was, in toto, all the impossible things. They had given birth to him with their damnable practices and ignorances. Oh, how wrong they were. They needed to be shown. He would show them. Sun is good. So is night. There is nothing wrong with dark, they said. Dark is horror, he shouted, silently, facing the little houses. It is meant for contrast. You must fear, you hear? That has always been the way of this world, you destroyers of Edgar Allan Poe and fine big-worded Lovecraft, you burner of Halloween masks and destroyer of pumpkin jack-o'-lanterns. I will make night what it once was, the thing against which man built all his lantern cities 
and his many children. As if in answer to this, a rocket, flying low, trailing a long rakish feather of flame. It made Lantry flinch and draw back. Four. It was but ten miles to the little town of Scienceport. He made it by dawn, walking. But even this was not good. At four in the morning, a silver beetle pulled up on the road beside him. Hello, called the man inside. Hello, said Lantry, wearily. Why are you walking? asked the man. I'm going to Scienceport. Why don't you ride? I like to walk. Nobody likes to walk. Are you sick? May I give you a ride? Thanks, but I like to walk. The man hesitated then closed the beetle door. Good night. When the beetle was gone over the hill, Lantry retreated into a nearby forest, a world full of bungling, helping people. By God, you couldn't even walk without being accused of sickness. That meant only one thing. He must not walk any longer. He had to ride. He should have accepted that fellow's offer. The rest of the night he walked far enough off the highway so that if a beetle rushed by, he had time to vanish in the underbrush. At dawn, he crept into an empty dry water drain and closed his eyes. The dream was as perfect as a rhymed snowflake. He saw the graveyard where he had lain deep and ripe over the centuries. He heard the early morning footsteps of the laborers returning to finish their work. Would you mind passing me the shovel, Jim? Here you go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's up? Look here. We didn't finish last night, did we? No. There was one more coffin, wasn't there? Yes. Well, here it is. And open. You've got the wrong hole. What's the name say on the gravestone? Lantry. William Lantry. That's him, that's the one. Gone. What could have happened to it? How do I know? The body was here last night. We can't be sure we didn't look. God, man, people don't bury empty coffins. He was in this box. Now he isn't. Maybe this box was empty. Nonsense. Smell that smell? He was here all right. A pause. Nobody would have taken the body, would they? What for? A curiosity, perhaps? Don't be ridiculous. People just don't steal. Nobody steals. Well, then there's only one solution. And? He got up and walked away. A pause. In the dark dream, Lantry expected to hear laughter. There was none. Instead, the voice of the gravedigger, after a thoughtful pause, said, Yes, that's it indeed. He got up and walked away. That's interesting to think about, said the other. Isn't it, though? Silence. Lantry awoke. It had all been a dream, but God, how realistic. How strangely the two men had carried on. But not unnaturally, oh no. That was exactly how you expected men of the future to talk. Men of the future. Lantry grinned wryly. That was an anachronism for you. This was the future. This was happening now. It wasn't three hundred years from now. It was now, not then or any other time. This wasn't the twentieth century. Oh, how calmly those two men in the dream had said, He got up and walked away. Interesting to think about, isn't it, though? With never a quaver in their voices with not so much as a glance over their shoulders or a tremble of spade in hand. But of course, with their perfectly honest, logical minds, there was but one explanation. Certainly nobody had stolen the corpse. Nobody steals. The corpse had simply got up and walked off. The corpse was the only one who could have possibly moved the corpse. By the few casual slow words of the gravediggers, Lantry knew what they were thinking. Here was a man that had lain in suspended animation, not really dead, 
for hundreds of years. The jarring about, the activity, had brought him back. Everyone had heard of those little green toads that are sealed for centuries inside mud rocks or in ice paddies, alive, alive, oh, and when scientists chipped them out and warmed them like marbles in their hands, the little toads leaped about and frisked and blinked. Then it was only logical that the gravediggers think of William Lantry in like fashion. But what if the various parts were fitted together in the next day or so? If the vanished body and the shattered, exploded incinerator were connected? What if this fellow named Burke, who had returned pale from Mars, went to the library again and said to the young woman he wanted some books and she said, oh, your friend Lantry was in the other day. And he'd say, Lantry who? Don't know anyone by that name. And she'd say, oh, he lied. And people in this time didn't lie. So it would all form and coalesce, item by item, bit by bit. A pale man who was pale and shouldn't be had lied and people don't lie. And a walking man on a lonely country road had walked, and people don't walk anymore. And a body was missing from a cemetery, and the incinerator had blown up, and, and, and... They would come after him. They would find him. He would be easy to find. He walked. He lied. He was pale. They would find him and take him and stick him through the open firelock of the nearest burner. And that would be your Mr. William Lantry, like a Fourth of July set piece. There was only one thing to be done, efficiently and completely. He arose in violent moves. His lips were wide, and his dark eyes were flared, and there was a trembling and burning all through him. He must kill and kill and kill and kill and kill. He must make his enemies into friends, into people like himself, who walked but shouldn't walk, who were pale in a land of pinks. He must kill and then kill and then kill again. He must make bodies and dead people and corpses. He must destroy incinerator after flu, after burner, after incinerator, explosion on explosion, death on death, then when the incinerators were all in throne ruin and the hastily established morgues were jammed with the bodies of people shattered by the explosion, then he would begin his making of friends, his enrollment of the dead in his own cause. Before they traced and found and killed him, they must be killed themselves. So far he was safe. He could kill and they would not kill back. People simply do not go around killing. That was his safety margin. He climbed out of the abandoned drain, stood in the road. He took the knife from his pocket and hailed the next beetle. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Pillar of Fire, Part 1 of 2 by Ray Bradbury. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs> <laughs>